Welcome to the afternoon session for uh, Tuesday. And now we will be uh, hearing from Haraldo Jeshke. Did I say that right? Yes, yes. Um, who is at the Research Institute for Interdisciplinary Science at the Okiyama Institute in Japan. And he will be talking about field tunable toroidal mo moment in a chiral lattice magnet. So, to just. Okay, thank you, Arnav. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the organizers, Yasir and Shubro, for the great job they've done uh, in setting up this meeting. It's a great pleasure to meet all friends here and make new friends. Uh, so, I'm very happy to actually um, have uh, that I was able to come here and um, to get to know this beautiful place uh, in Mangalo. And um, I would like to um, tell you today um, uh, one topic um, from uh, my recent research. And um, so let me um, first acknowledge um, the, um, my collaborators. Um, so um, this project um, came to me um, via my friend Igor Mazin, who um, did uh, the DFT calculations uh, together with me here. And um, so what I'm going to talk about um, is a chiral um, uh, uh, crystal um, that is um, the fruit of um, the multi-decade um, search of um, Sang Chung for um, exotic uh, multiferroic uh, materials. And so this material was grown in, uh, in his group and um, the inelastic, no, the, the neutron diffraction experiment was done uh, in Hubo Tsao's group at Oak Ridge um, National Laboratory. And um, very important um, is the um, theoretical modeling done uh, by uh, Xiao Jin Bai um, here. So this is Huibo. And um, the um, understanding of the Dialoshinsky Moria that is important here um, is due to Daniel Komsky. Um, all right. Now, um, let me um, get started by introducing um, uh, what is a toroidal moment. So this, um, this talk is going to be about toroidal moments and uh, switching them in an unusual way. And uh, so a toroidal moment classically um, can be um, uh, achieved by making such a solenoid. So um, by um, winding uh, copper and making this into a torus. And then uh, if you um, have a current, you get a um, circular magnetic field and that um, creates a toroidal moment. Um, so that's the classical case. And then in uh, microscopically, you can get toroidal moments if you have um, crystals where you have um, head to tail spin configurations. For example, here shown um, six spins um, um, like this. And then um, you can convince yourself easily that if you um, for, um, calculate um, this quantity, um, R dot um, um, uh, R cross moment, um, and sum up over all these moments, then um, you get something that um, points out of the screen um, in case of um, anti-clockwise um, magnetic arrangement of the spins and points in um, in case of um, clockwise arrangement of the spins. And then if you uh, imagine a crystal where um, such elements are arranged in a way, it's, um, it's clear that um, with these um, counterclockwise and clockwise um, arrangements, you can, you can also have domains. Yeah? So you can ha um, have ferro-toroidal arrangement, um, like shown here for, for plus toroidal moment, and here for minus toroidal moment, and then um, you, in your crystal you can, you can have domains. All right. And um, now, um, once, you, um, once you have this, um, the next question is, um, you might um, actually want to control this. So you want to, um, uh, you want, um, to take your moments and, um, and um, uh, take control of them. And so we know for all kinds of um, ferroic uh, quantities how to do that, right? So if we have dipoles in a material, um, like um, here, um, a ferroelectric material, then um, we, um, we need electric fields um, to, uh, to switch um, the polarizations. If we have a ferromagnetic uh, material and then we have a ferromagnetic domain, in order to switch it to the opposite um, orientation, uh, we need magnetic fields. For um, elastic domain, ferroelastic domains, uh, we um, need to stress our crystal in certain directions. Um, so um, for the ferrotoroidic um, situation, 
um, it's now a bit more complicated. We actually need uh, something which is electric field cross magnetic field. That is the source of the um, toroidal moment. So we need to control this in order to switch our um, 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 toroidal domains. And um, so this um, shows, uh, shows you that um, switching um, toroidal moments is sort of more involved than, um, than switching um, um, dipoles or switching magnetic moments because um, you need two fields, right? So, so and that um, is traditionally um, um, the case. Uh, usually, um, if you have such a setup, you need um, some um, fields, electric and magnetic fields at an angle to switch. And um, now this, um, you will see, um, is different in the material that I, um, I'm going to introduce to you today. today. And um, one important property of this material is that it's a chiral material. So chiral chirality is handedness. Um, it means that um, um, in a property of a material that if you um, mirror the material, so like for example, these screws or these triangles, if you um, apply a mirror operation, then to go back, you cannot simply shift and rotate. That doesn't work, right? I mean, so if you just translate and rotate, you're never going to get your original um, back. So that's, um, that's the uh, property um, of chirality. And um, um, chirality is known to be important for stabilizing unusual magnetic orders. So there's um, um, multiferroic materials, manganese, antimonate, there are um, skirmium materials, manganese, silis, uh, sil uh, silicon, um, there are um, Helicity, um, um, uh, helical and chiral materials like this, uh, this complicated oxide. Um, all right, so this, um, is, this property is going to be important um, in, in the material. Now, um, let me um, introduce now um, a specific situation where triangles are involved. So um, here I show you um, the toroidal moment um, of chiral vortices. Yeah, so um, we, we have heard um, uh, about uh, magnetic frustration um, in, uh, in materials. So as soon as you have triangular motifs in a material and you have classical spins, um, the ground state spin configuration is a 120 degree state. And um, in, uh, in this state, um, you have um, two possibilities um, of, um, 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 of orientation. Yeah? So you can... Um, and then if you um, consider um, tilting your moment slightly off the plane, you have an effective magnetic moment. Yes, and this is, these are the four um, situations, um, four, four configurations that are shown there. All of them are um, moments that are at 120 degree um, angles towards, uh, to each other, and they are slightly tilted up or slightly tilted down. And um, once you have that, now you can define uh, a number of quantities. Um, the last quantity, the scalar chirality, um, it's, um, um, it's this um, um, uh, product um, S1 cross S2 dot S3. Um, that basically measures the me um, how non-coplanar your, um, um, your configuration, configuration is. Um, the vector chirality, um, epsilon, um, uh, med, um, is um, as, um, characterizes the sense of um, sp uh, spin orientation around an, an oriented loop. And the chirality that um, I want to um, focus on is the toroidal moment. I gave you the definition already, um, measured um, here from the center of the triangle. And now um, this toroidal moment um, can, um, in a chiral configuration, we can have left-handed and right-handed. And the crystal I'm going to show you has only one hand. So that means we have to um, either choose left or right. And then um, there are two possibilities for the toroidal moment. It can be uh, minus or plus um, 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 with respect to the magnetic moment. Yeah? So the magnetic moment is defined by the slight um, um, out of plane tilt um, of, um, of the spins. And um, so um, we can either have um, parallel um, or anti-parallel. And, um, and these two configurations, um, for example, if you focus on left, are, um, um, are linked to 120 degree flips of the spins. Yes? So um, that's, um, uh, that's what you have. And also um, up or down um, magnetic moment. Yes? So that's, um, um, that is what um, 
that is sort of um, at the heart of uh, what I'm going to tell you um, after I introduce my material. Now let's come to the material. The material is barium cobalt um, silicate. Um, this, um, the structure um, is shown here. Um, cobalt is in blue, um, barium is in green, um, silicon is in gray, and then um, it's called a stuffed tridimide structure. Um, tridimide um, is a silica um, structure, so silicon dioxide. And um, so you can um, imagine coming to this structure um, if you stuff um, um, this tridimide structure with barium oxide and, uh, and cobalt oxide. Yeah, so um, that gives you um, then also uh, immediately the valence. So barium, of course, two plus, cobalt two plus. Then um, we expect seven D electrons in cobalt, which gives us spin three half, classical, um, classical spins. And you can see that um, these um, silicon oxygen tetrahedra um, in the structure are um, sitting all um, a little bit um, like disordered. They all have slight tilts. That's kind of important. That's typical of, of silicates that um, they have some sort of, um, I mean, um, some, some degree of, um, um, of, of tilts and um, very complicated structures. Um, that's going to be important um, later. Now, what I drew between um, the blue cobalt ions um, are colored lines um, which indicate um, in qu uh, quotation mark nearest neighbor bonds. All of um, them um, are um, the same um, order in second order perturbation theory um, that um, uh, Carlo explained to us nicely. So if you count, if you want to go from one cobalt um, via um, hopping, you have to go to oxygen, silicon, oxygen, cobalt. Yes? So you always need four hops. That's, that's the true for all, uh, for all these colors. Yeah? That means um, in, um, from, um, from the point of view of second order perturbation theory, they could all bas um, basically be um, important and um, uh, non-zero non and uh, we have to uh, we have to figure out what they are. Yeah, so um, you can see um, these, are, these are five colors and actually because of the handedness, there are six. So um, because of the chirality, there is a J3A and J3B, um, a left hand and a right hand. Um, and um, the names that I'm going to use for the, um, for the exchange paths here um, is basically um, giving, um, saying what they are. So JT means a triangular coupling. The, the J1 is the nearest neighbor coupling is, is forming triangles. And there are two other triangles, blue and yellow triangles. So they are called JT prime and JT two prime. And then there is a coupling along Z, J4, that's orange, that go, goes along, uh, along Z direction. And there are um, um, uh, two, um, two other um, couplings um, in this direction. All right. now. Um, here is the problem um, as um, um, that I saw um, um, in the beginning of this project. So um, in Oak Ridge, they already had um, done very nice neutron diffraction experiments and they had found um, this magnetic structure. And now if you look at this structure, it, um, it looks incomprehensively complicated. So how do you explain this structure based on um, these six exchange paths, which I, which I showed you. So that was the question. I mean, um, it's, um, you can stare at it for a long time. It's very difficult. So let's try to do the cal um, calculation. So let's try to figure out what the exchanges are. Maybe then we can understand um, the mag uh, magnetic pattern. And so um, the starting point always is um, doing a band structure calculation. So here um, in upper left, you see um, the band structure colored um, with the cobalt um, 3D character. So as Carlo explained, um, in, um, in crystal field, uh, you get T2G EG splitting. Uh, here, EG, the two EG um, orbitals are below the T2G orbitals. So uh, blue and yellow are the T2G, um, uh, are the EG orbitals, dz square and x square minus y square. And um, so the Fermi level at zero um, it, uh, goes um, through the middle of the T2G orbitals. We have three electrons um, in the T2G orbitals, half fill T2G, yes, that gives us our spin three half. And um, then um, if we focus only on the T2G, 
uh, we can make a tight binding model and we can try to figure out, I mean, that would be the way to do um, second order perturbation theory, figure out the hopping uh, strength, right? And so the um, figure at the bottom gives you the hoppings. Now, um, they are um, shown as function of cobalt cobalt distance. So these are all the five distances that I pointed out um, in the structure, um, which are all um, basically the same order. And you can see that the hoppings are all kind of, um, kind of large. We basically need to consider all these hoppings. So, um, so this, um, um, and this is now the situation where um, it's useful to apply uh, DFT energy mapping. So that's um, the method I would like to explain in a few slides. Yes. No, no, it's, a, it's an insulator. Yes. Yeah. Um, ah, yes, I showed you, I showed you a band structure without a gap. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, there, there's a U, um, you will see. Um, DFT plus U opens a gap and um, you, you have a very reasonable gap in, in all the magnetic calculations that I do. Yes. Um, so now here, um, um, here is um, the, the way to, um, uh, to do energy mapping. What energy mapping means is I make a unit cell, uh, a supercell, in this case, square root two by square root two supercell. And um, I take out the symmetry so that I have many different um, cobalt sites, which I can choose uh, individually. And um, so in, in this case, it's 12, yes? So 12 cobalt sites. And these 12 cobalt sites, um, I, I can choose um, either up or down, yes? I do collinear um, magnetic calculations. That means I can only choose moments which are um, up or down, yes? And, and so um, here I show you a bunch of maybe 25 and um, I calculate very precise DFT, all electron DFT energies. They are given here um, in milli electron volt for, per, per cobalt, yes? And then I fit them to the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, yes? And, um, and you see the fit um, is excellent. And uh, what I get as a result of the fit ah, is, is something like this. But let me first uh, try to convince you that this uh, method is, um, is actually um, useful. I mean, um, not all of you have seen this before. So um, there are a few applications of this method that actually um, very clearly show the usefulness. Um, one of these ap uh, applications um, was, uh, was done with um, Pratia Ngosh and uh, Yassir Iqbal, who are um, in the audience, and um, uh, also Johannes Reuter, who unfortunately cannot come. And um, so, um, no, sorry, the, uh, the next one, um, okay. Um, and um, the first one is about breathing, breathing chromium spinels. And so um, you, uh, in these chromium spinels, you have um, small tetrahedra and large tetrahedra. And before we, um, we studied these, they were always discussed in terms of um, J for small tetrahedron, J for large tetrahedron, J and J prime. That was, the, um, that was the range. Then we showed that second and third neighbors are absolutely relevant in these materials. And after our um, publication, immediately the richer Hamiltonian is the new standard. And there have been a number of publications um, that follow this new standard of analysis and actually can understand um, um, the experiments. The second example is a diamond lattice antiferromagnet, um, manganese scandium 2 sulfur 4. So um, um, in this study, um, we looked at um, um, a material which seemed to have been solved. There was a Nature Physics in 2016, which beautifully explained um, um, neutron, um, um, uh, inelastic neutron scattering experiment with a J1, J2 model. So still, um, we applied um, DFT energy mapping and found that J3 is actually a coupling that is absolutely essential. So that gives you um, extra understanding um, of, of the material. And um, since then, uh, this uh, three coupling model is the new minimal model. And uh, a Nature paper by Oksana Zahako in 2020 um, clearly shows this. Um, so um, this um, generation um, of magnetic Hamiltonians is, um, is really a way to progress in understanding 3D and 4D um, magnets. Now, let's look at the result of the energy mapping. Um, for barium cobalt silicate. Um, this is the kind of plot um, where I show you 
the res um, result of the fitting, the exchange couplings as function of um, um, interaction u in the uh, DFT plus u. Yeah, so DFT does a bad job at um, strongly correlated orbitals. The cobalt 3D orbitals are not treated properly. Therefore, we need a correction. And the simplest correction is a DFT plus U correction, um, basically adding um, a Hubbard-like um, term um, to, um, to the DFT energy. And then we can open a gap. And then we can um, get um, this dependence um, on U. Um, so, uh, what we expect from um, perturbation theory um, that Carlo explained is that um, such, uh, such a dependency is S1 over U. Yes? So the, uh, the largest coupling we expect to behave um, uh, as, as 1 over U. And um, this, this we can see here. And now this plot immediately um, puts, um, um, puts our focus on two couplings, JT and JZ. Yes, these couplings are big, um, blue and orange. These are big couplings. Um, the other couplings we will discuss later. They are not zero, yes? Um, so um, I didn't plot zero couplings. I mean, I also, um, I, I calculated 12 couplings. The others are effectively zero. We can forget about them. These four smaller ones are not zero, but um, they are for, to be discussed later. So let's first understand um, the spin structure. We can do that um, based on blue and orange. So here is the structure again. Red magnetic moments is what neutron diffraction finds. Um, and then we can now um, see, okay, the blue triangles actually um, are easily understandable. That's a 120 degree order of large antiferromagnetic coupling of, um, um, of classical spins. Yeah? So no problem to understand that. Um, orange is actually just antiferromagnetic arrangement along Z direction. Yeah, so um, if you follow the orange bonds, you see um, they are just alternating. Yeah, so these two um, couplings are perfectly satisfied in um, the um, spin configuration observed by neutrons. And now comes the surprise. This is actually um, chopping up our 3D crystal into three intertwined um, lattices. Um, they are shown with different colors here, red, um, cyan, and blue. So they are not connected. So if you follow um, the light blue atoms, you see that light blue atoms connect to light blue atoms via um, blue and orange, but not to others. And so um, that is how you get um, these, um, these intertwined um, lattices. Um, so um, our, our two couplings, which we um, looked at um, so far, um, now define three sublattices. And um, Next, um, let's um, try to understand um, the um, magnetization measurement. Um, so um, here you can see that um, in relatively small magnetic fields, you have um, metamagnetic transitions. And um, um, at one Tesla and, um, and, um, and the red line is, um, is now um, the magnetization curve that follows um, from the exchange Hamiltonian um, that I showed you. And now let's try, um, let's, um, let's understand what is happening at, um, at these steps. So what is happening is this. Here I show you again uh, these three lat um, sublattices. This is shown at zero field. At zero field, um, you, can, um, you can see um, red um, sublattice and blue sublattice. And then um, if you take into account the small out of um, uh, plane, out of triangle component, um, you can assi assign um, a toroidal moment of plus to them. And for the, um, for the cyan sublattice, um, the toroidal moment um, is minus. And um, so that means that um, because these three sublattices are so far um, not connected, um, they um, form, um, three uh, toroidal moments and two are plus and one is minus. That means this zero field magnetic structure, oh yes. It, Sorry, it works, yeah. So your DFT plus U, do you also get Spin orbit, I mean, do you include spin orbit coupling? Do you get uh, anisotropies in your model? Because it appears to me that like 
if you want to have this historical moment, it is ultimately related to this. Yes, absolutely. So, um, 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 so um, the DFT calculations that, that I do are collinear. So they um, allow me to um, work out um, with spin orbit coupling, I can work out single ion anisotropy. Um, but I cannot um, calculate Jalushinsky Moria because for that one needs non collinear um, uh, calculations. And this is um, this we did not um, do here. In fact, um, the um, DM, which is essential, of course, um, is inferred. So Daniel Komsky um, uh, worked out arguments um, how it should be. So uh, it's simply a much more involved um, calculation um, to, uh, to work out um, the DM. So um, it's sort of. Um, it's a puzzle, and one piece of the puzzle is understanding the basic structure. So what, uh, what you can understand from collinear DFT is um, the, um, the basic spin configuration plus the frustration. The small couplings you will see lead to some small degree of frustration. Um, and then the toroidal moments, um, they, uh, they need the DM, and um, the DM um, is, um, is a small extra, um, extra term. Yeah, so, um, but um, that's not, not at this point not calculated by me. Um, okay, so this was um, zero field, and we, because we have plus plus minus toroidal moments, we have a ferry toroidal um, situation. Yes, so we have a total toroidal moment of plus one t. And um, now, if we um, increase the magnetic field to two Tesla, um, what you if you compare that um, if you focus on cyan, you see um, the moments on uh, cyan lattice switch. Yes. Um, they switch. That's what I explained on the triangle before. Um, if, um, if you switch by 180 degree, um, um, then um, you go into the other toroidal um, um, situation. So now all sublattices have the same toroidal moment and we switch to 3T. And that means that in this, um, in this plot, uh, we can actually see um, four different um, uh, toroidal states, um, pl uh, three plus, three minus and uh, one plus and one minus. Um, um, okay. um, see. So it's, um, yeah. Um, that's basically, um, that's basically where we want to um, attack. Right? I mean, our toroidal moment are linked to the small out of um, out of triangle tilts um, of uh, the moment. So the the small um, ferromagnetic component um, in the triangle, and this we want to switch. Um, all right. So okay. Um, now um, a little bit more um, detail um, about um, about the mechanism of this transition. So. Um, as Carlo pointed out, um, DM is important. Um, and at the bottom there, um, the in-plane DM, um, DM vectors, um, DM components are shown, and they are responsible um, for, um, uh, for making uh, out of plane, um, out of triangular plane um, tilts of um, the magnetic moment, and thus um, for creating um, the toroidal moments. And now, um, here at the bottom is the energy ba um, balance um, for ferry toroidal versus ferrotoroidal. So at zero field, um, the, um, the ferry toroidal wins um, because of the um, because of the balance of the small frustrating interactions. So all of these interactions are sort of on triangles. So we have a lot more small antiferromagnetic interactions that cannot be satisfied by, by the overall spin configurations. Yeah? So we, we, we saw that the overall spin configuration with 180 degree and antiferromagnetic is fully satisfied, but then there are small triangles which are frustrated and then um, um, here, the frustrated triangles are shown um, in, um, in red, and um, you can see that the ferry toroidal has less frustrated triangles than the ferro toroidal. That means you need um, to put in, um, to force um, it, um, it slightly, uh, put in um, some, um, some energy um, to, um, uh, to switch to the, um, to the ferro um, toroidal state. And um, so, I um, have um, little time now. Um, I 
uh, I have some, some details about how this works. So uh, one can convince, um, you can, um, and that's, that's um, um, uh, Xiaojian's um, work, uh, you can um, convince yourself that the out-of-plane Jaloshinsky Moria is actually favoring coplanar spin configurations. So that is not what we need to understand the magnetic structure. Yes, the observed magnetic structure um, has out-of-plane spin components. Um, what we actually need um, are the in-plane um, 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 the in-plane components um, of the Loshinsky moria And here um, in these plots now, um, you can see um, the energy balance as we um, focus on one sublattice and we rotate the spins. And there you can see that um, the rotation angle zero, um, which um, where the toroidal moment is opposite the net moment. Yes, so we, in the net moment um, is, uh, is plus one in, in units of sublattices, and um, there's one two, uh, two up sublattices and one down sublattice. So now if we look at the down sublattice, then we see that um, um, as we rotate um, um, the spin configurations by 180, we go to a maximum, that's the black line. And if we split this up into contributions from different um, uh, couplings, we can see that um, the um, JC coupling is, uh, is actually opposing um, the flipping of the spin and um, the JT prime coupling is encouraging the flipping of the spins. That means um, there's a subtle balance between the smaller couplings. Um, some of them are in favor of going to the ferrotoroidal and some of them are against ferrotoroidal. And um, altogether, um, this gives this, um, uh, this beautiful um, uh, magnetization curve uh, with steps um, that uh, was measured in experiment. All right, so um, I, I, I want to summarize um, a little bit. So um, um, we, um, we see that um, the, the magnetic frustration in these um, antiferromagnetic triangles uh, leads to a vortex-like um, configuration. And um, then um, manipulating toroidal moments um, directly with a magnetic field um, becomes possible in this um, chiral vortex. And that's uh, very special about this compound. And the key property um, of this, the uh, T-determined Hamiltonian um, of this material um, is um, a special hierarchy of, um, of interactions, which is um, absolutely not obvious, which cannot um, easily be guessed. And um, now, um, um, so um, this, is, uh, this is my summary. This work um, has, uh, has been published. And um, so uh, DFT plus uh, theoretical modeling um, provides um, a quantitative um, explanation of this um, complex magnetic structure and the field-induced metamagnetic and toroidal phase transitions. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you. Oh, I forgot one thing. Can I just add? Uh, Absolutely. A, a little... Um, a slide um, to invite um, um, everyone to Okayama. In particular, if you know of someone who is considering doing a PhD and um, is maybe um, enthusiastic about Japan, uh, we are always looking for PhD students in our new institute. And so here you can see uh, where we are working in the west of Japan um, between um, Osaka and Hiroshima. Uh, so, I mean, please pass the word if you know of someone who would like to do a PhD. Okay, thank you. Yes. I, I have two questions. One is related to the uh, last two, no, one, okay, so two slides before, or three slides before, when you show the energy against the rotation. Yeah, yeah. So this is in the, uh, oops, I think I, I'm more back. Yeah, yeah. This, this is in the presence of magnetic field. Um, Mm, uh, no, 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 that's not, that's not, that is sort of for understanding the ground state. I mean, that's for, uh, it, it's, this is for understanding uh, basically um, what I showed in the slide before. Um, what I showed in, in this slide, um, what? Huh. Ah, 
what I showed in this slide. This is for explaining this energy balance, right? I mean, why is the ferry toroidal um, the ground state and not the ferro toroidal? And, um, and so, um, so the consideration is for zero field um, in, in this plot. Yeah. But I was confused is that I thought that if you have 120, 180 degree, that would be equivalent to a vessel of spin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's what I um, tried to explain in the beginning. That if you if you focus on one-handedness, um, this is slower than than this. Um, if you focus on one-handedness, uh, basically what you need to do um, to go from minus toroidal moment to plus toroidal moment is um, um, wrote, um, to do a twofold rotation to to um, to basically reverse each spin. Yeah. Uh, yes. It would be time time. In the, I mean, acting the time reversal operation to the spins. And if your Hamiltonian is time reversal invariant, it should be the same energy. So this is why, my, my, why I was puzzled before. Ah, oh, um, okay. Um, okay, so um, I, I'm, um, I'm at the moment um, not quite sure um, which terms are included into um, in, right. into these uh, into okay. these. Yes, thank you. And I have a second question. Uh, I might not remember that. Maybe, did you mention magnetoelectric properties? Or, or didn't? I yeah. don't know. Not 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 at this point. I mean, you didn't. Okay. Material, sorry. Sorry. Mistake. Yeah. I mean, this material I think uh, has more surprises, but that's not uh, what uh, we focused on here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that experimental uh, plot M versus H, where you have these jumps. Yes. So what you measure is magnetization as a function of field. Yes. So, I mean, somehow I'm just trying to get a handle of this toroidal moment. If this is a physical moment, which of course it is, it is um, made of these moments itself. Could you? measure it directly? I mean, these plus plus minuses, these are associations based on your theory picture. Yeah, but um, you, you see, of, uh, I mean, I'm just so, uh, Oh, it's from from neutron diffraction. I mean, once um, you measure the uh, magnetic configuration on the sub lattice at zero field and at two Tesla, um, you can um, you can calculate. I mean, you have the moments, um, you have the uh, positions, you can calculate the toroidal moment. And um, so these are um, plus plus minus is assignment based on um, a neutron diffraction. But my question is, uh, would there be a direct way to sort of measure uh, uh, the toroidal moment? What field does it couple to? Like M couples to H. Yeah. So what probe could you apply in that? Apart from, of course, knowing the structure from diffraction. Apart from that, would there be a direct way of sort of it's like saying you measure polarization by applying field. You measure magnetization by applying field. Yeah. So what do you apply in order to uh, measure, for instance, uh, the toroidal moment? Or if this question at all has any? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a nice question. I mean, it's one of those questions that is maybe better passed to the experimentally um, uh, first uh, people in the audience. I mean, I, um, I'm, I, I cannot really answer that. So I, I, I can tell you how, where, where the knowledge here comes from. And in principle, I, I, um, I mentioned the source of the toroidal moment. So uh, I suppose that um, um, some uh, arrangement of, um, of um, uh, crossed um, electric and magnetic fields would um, in some way um, lead to a possibility also of measuring the, uh, the moments. So that's that's how you can access them, but um, but here fortunately we can access them very simply by just turning up magnetic field a little bit. Any further questions? Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, you just showed the magnetic structure with the toroidal moments. Yes. So that was from experiment. Yes. Uh, can we do it from DFT, like the same structure? Can we obtain it from DFT? Uh, first of all, is that the magnetic ground state? Um, uh, yes. So um, in in principle, in principle, um, you can uh, you can do it in non-collinear DFT calculations. So I'm pretty sure that in this case, where um, um, you have two strong interactions, 
DFT would basically give you um, this um, as a ground state. Um, um, but, um, but this is sort of a heavy calculation. And you cannot count on this in general, right? I mean, so in general, when you have highly frustrated mag um, lattices, um, you can count, uh, you, um, you can uh, determine DFT ground states, and, um, but they do not necessarily have to agree um, with um, the, uh, what many body methods for magnetism tell you um, is the ground state. So, for example, spin liquids are off limits for, for DFT. Yes, D DFT can maybe show you that um, a, a bunch of spin configurations are all low in energy, but it cannot give you a, a spin liquid state. But um, for, for classical magnets, often you can get a one-to-one one -one agreement that um, the structure that is determined by neutrons turns out to be also the lowest energy um, structure, um, lowest energy magnetic configuration in your DFT calculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had one more question. So, uh, as you said that to explain the structure, you calculated the Js right. from the to DFT total energy. So, what was the thought process behind taking those 13 Gs. Ah, okay. So, um, I mean, there's, there's some experience. Um, um, so, um, traditionally, there are many studies where people were sort of guessing and saying, well, this, this material um, maybe has first neighbor, maybe it has a second neighbor, and then um, calculating those two. And, um, but I, um, I saw many materials, and this was sort of the argument uh, why I showed you the super exchange paths, and that in this material, clearly, um, at the minimum, you have to calculate six couplings, otherwise you have nothing, because um, you cannot exclude any of these couplings. And then when you calculate six couplings, of course, there are uh, some slightly longer um, um, couplings, which are not guaranteed to be zero. And therefore, in order to be sure, I usually um, am a little bit generous in, in calculating exchanges. But it's also linked to the kind of supercell that you can afford to calculate. I mean, um, if you, um, sometimes one is simply limited, but it's, uh, the, it's the attempt to actually um, get the important couplings, that's six, plus make sure that no other couplings are going to spoil our, our, uh, our game. And so this, this, this come, in this case, comes, comes to 12 or 13. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, any further questions while Bridger sets up? I have a very quick question. So you have this three sub lattice string right. of triangular lattices. Um, is there any magnetization data? I think I just missed it. Maybe you had shown it, which shows uh, what's the energy of interaction, cross interaction between these three structures. And do you see some kind of a freezing between these three uh, sub lattices? Um, so, I mean, um, in, in principle, um, how difficult um, is it um, uh, to magnetize um, is contained in this red theoretical curve here. Um, so, um, um, but um, it's probably a bit complicated to, uh, to separate between uh, what the large couplings are doing against um, um, against polarization and what the small couplings are doing. But in principle, um, without knowing them, you don't get the slopes here. Okay, so that information is already contained in this one yeah, fit. Sort of, yeah. And it's okay. mixed up, of course, yes. I mean. <laughs> okay, right. thank you so much. Uh, if any further questions, well, uh, if not, then let's thank uh, Harold once again.